Welcome everyone. My name is Chris Caccarini. I'm the executive director at Neighborhood House. Thank you for joining us this evening. I would like to open this gathering with a native land recognition. The land acknowledgement that I'll be sharing was created by the Portland Indian Leaders Roundtable involving two dozen native agencies and their leaders to create a story in common about the native people of Portland. Together, PILR created a document describing the Portland native community designed to educate key audiences to the concerns of the native people of Portland and to share it as a resource for the community. We are gathered here in this place known as the Portland Metro area, which rests on traditional village sites of the Multnomah, Kathlamet, and Clackamas bands of Chinook, and the Tualatin, Kalapuya, Malala, and many other tribes who made their homes along the Columbia River, creating communities and summer encampments to harvest and use the plentiful natural resources of the area. On behalf of the panel, I want to say that we are really excited tonight to share both the PBS draft plan for the Southwest Corridor Light Rail and West Portland Town Center concept and the equity centered approach that is guiding our planning. It is a pleasure to welcome our group of presenters and panelists and I would like to give them an opportunity to introduce themselves and share their affiliations. Mohammed, would you like to start? Mm -hmm. Would you like to start, Mohammed? Hi. Hi. So uh, my name is Mohammed Salim Bahamadi, uh, founder, director uh, at Haki Community Organization, uh, representing East African Swahili speaking communities. And um, Haki Community is a multicultural, um, serves all uh, uh, the BIPOC uh, communities uh, here in Southwest uh, Portland. Um, all right, next. Thanks, Mohammed. John? Hi, my name is uh, John DePero. I'm with Sweeney or Southwest Neighborhoods, Inc. We are the coalition office for the 17 neighborhood associations in Southwest Portland. Thank you, John. Uh, Commissioner Myron. Yeah, I am Sharon Myron. Uh, I am the Multnomah County Commissioner representing District 1. That is all of Multnomah County west of the Willamette River. Uh, and it also inner southeast out to Cesar Chavez or 39th. And I am also an emergency room doctor. And I'm also, perhaps most importantly here, a neighbor. I live in Hillsdale. And uh, yeah, just right up from the library and from the high school here. Thank you. Nuhamin. Hi, everyone. My name is Nuhamin Aiden. My pronouns are she, they, and I'm with Unite Oregon. I uh, manage the Southwest Equity, uh, the Southwest Corridor Equity Coalition. Uh, I also live in Southwest Portland on um, Capitol Highway and a little bit um, toward Multnomah Village from um, Barber Boulevard. And uh, I'm also a parent to an eight-year-old and um, love working with all of you here and the coalition. Thank you, Nuhami. Ryan? Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Ryan Curran. I'm with the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability at the city of Portland. Uh, I'm the project manager for our community planning work along the Portland portion of the Southwest Corridor. And my job pretty much is working with communities to co-create plans like the West Portland Town Center plan to achieve a community vision that aligns with the city's kind of broader vision for equitable growth. Thanks. Thanks, Ryan. Joan? Good evening, everybody. My name is Joan Fredrickson. I'm also with the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. Um, I am working as well with Ryan and Hannah on the West Portland Town Center plan. Um, my other roles <laughs> include um, working with the um, West Side uh, communities and as a West District liaison in the, the planning department. Thanks, Joan. Hannah? 
Hello, everyone. My name is Hannah Osman. I'm an uh, assistant planner working on the Bush Plant Task Center, working with Ryan and Joan. Um, I have the pleasure of working with Hockey and Community Alliance of Tenants and Unite Oregon on this project. So it's been really great. Um, so, yeah. Thanks, Hannah. And lastly, the, the person behind the curtain, Ellen. <laughs> Very behind the curtain. Uh, my name is Ellen Field, um, and I'm the volunteer and community engagement coordinator at Neighborhood House, um, working closely with Chris on projects like this. Happy to be here. Thanks, everyone. Uh, lastly, before we begin, I want to provide an, an overview of our presentation tonight and highlight just a few points. This is uh, an early phase in an extended planning process, though, so there will be lots of opportunities to get engaged down the road on the draft plan. Uh, your voice matters and has impact. Uh, so you will have the opportunity, in fact, you're invited to share your thoughts and questions beyond our engagement this evening. Uh, this is an information heavy session. Uh, to be sure we can get through it all, we're going with this seminar format that we're using tonight, uh, where guests are muted uh, but we will be recording the presentation and you're welcome at any time to enter questions into the Q&A uh, button on the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'll try to get to the questions that we can and for any that we can't, we'll try to follow up with an FAQ. If you would like a personal follow up or, or have a very specific question or would just like to stay informed and find ways to get further involved, please uh, include your email in a private chat message in the chat window and then we can follow up with you directly. Uh, we're going to start out uh, with a presentation on the Southwest Corridor Light Rail and West Portland Town Center plan. Uh, then we're going to uh, talk a little bit about SWEC, give an overview there, uh, and talk about equity priorities. Uh, and then the commissioner is going to talk a little bit about health equity. And then John is going to talk about equitable invo involvement uh, in representation and community development. Uh, and then we'll break into a panel discussion and we have some questions that we're going to pose to these panelists here. So that's that's our basic overview and, and format. And I'll go ahead and turn it over to Ryan and Hannah and Joan for the Southwest Quarter Light Rail presentation. Thank you, Chris. Um, I will give a little bit of context for the, the light rail and the broader corridor-wide equitable development strategy. Um, but I'm mostly gonna talk about the West Portland Town Center plan and, and what is out currently as a discussion draft. Um, I'm here with the, the rest of the West Portland Town Center team from BPS, um, Joan and Hannah and um, uh, later Eric Ingstrom should be joining us. Um, and uh, so we hope to have a little bit of back and forth, a little bit of Q and A if possible. Um, this work, uh, we, around community planning along the corridor. Uh, we're calling it the Inclusive Communities Project. And um, it came from a council directive in 2018 when the, the city of Portland, along with the city of Tigard, um, adopted a, a equitable housing strategy for the whole corridor. This was in anticipation of approving the, uh, the alignment of the light rail. Um, and it directed the planning Bureau to do area planning and use specifically a health and fair housing lens in our work. And so we had discretion on where to start with. And we chose the, uh, the areas circled here um, along the, the alignment, along the corridor of uh, NATO and in South Portland and then the West Portland Town Center. Um, both are major pr priorities, regional priorities. Um, and both are priorities regardless of, of light rail. Um, the NATO project it also includes a realignment of the Ross Island Bridgehead, and that's been a, a you know 30-year priority that um, has yet to be delivered. And then the West Portland Town Center, I'll, I'll talk more about how it, it is the only town center um, in this area, and it's the only town center in our city that doesn't have a plan. Um, so it's a it's a, a priority regardless of, of light rail, though um, it is built upon the premise that some major form of high capacity transit does exist because town centers are supposed to be served by that. We anticipate bringing both both of these plans to the planning commission and then to city council in uh, the early part of winter, and then um, spring and summer. 
Um, so that's that's the process that we'll uh, I'll give a little more detail about. Um, and when we know whether light rail funding and the timeline is more concrete, we would then move on to other areas along the corridor, like 30th and Hamilton and whatnot. Um, so the next slide is an image of a, a kind of key light rail dates um, under the premise that um, that the voters approve a measure this November. Um, so we're at 30% design in terms of where, you know, station locations um, and some basic design. There's actually a conceptual design report uh, that folks can look at and get some pretty detailed look at, at each station area. There is the November vote. Um, if the voters approve it, then there would be a um, each city along the corridor, um, including Portland, would have a binding commitment of local match uh, for their portion of the funds in tw early 2021. And then, then um, TriMet could go for federal funding in 2022, uh, which would allow then construction to uh, begin in 2022 and um, a five-year construction period. So that's if everything goes well, right? If voters reject the measure this November, then TriMet has to uh, rethink this timing and the funding options, um, though the potential for a federal stimulus um, is something that, you know, folks are optimistic about. Um, so that's, that there'll be many, many options at that point to, to explore, um, but we're hoping for a successful uh, vote in November. Um, going, you'll hear a lot about this tonight. Um, alongside this light rail planning, um, I already mentioned there's an equitable housing strategy that has um, targets for affordable and market rate housing and strategies for anti-displacement and in, in improving fair housing and opportunity and access to more housing choices. Um, a equitable development strategy uh, that Metro has convened over the last three years really built off of the, the housing work to also focus on workforce training and small business development, really kind of rounding out an equity strategy that has affordability and housing, work work opportunity and small business entrepreneurial opportunity to create this equitable development strategy. Um, so it's a little more holistic approach and we'll talk about that uh, more in terms of like what that looks like and, and what kind of priorities are in that. Uh, the process I want, uh, to develop that um, has resulted in the Southwest Equity Coalition um, being a steward of this strategy and uh, Nuhamin and Muhammad and and others will talk about how this really, really unique coalition that's composed um, and led by community-based organizations, but also includes local government, funders, nonprofits, service providers, and affordable housing developers, a really unique combination of all the people that it takes to really implement a, a bold vision for equitable growth, right? So you'll hear about, about some of their subcommittees on um, anti-displacement. Um, there's also a subcommittee just on the West Portland Town Center because of the, uh, it's a priority area for, for getting, getting it right this time. So kind of segueing into, into this work, um, next slide is an overview of, of, this is the Town Center. Um, it is located where Barbara intersects with I-5 and Southwest Capitol. Um, as a Town Center, it was identified in the Metro 2040 plan and then incorporated into the um, 2035 comprehensive plan by the city of Portland. Town centers for context, they're supposed to have lots of housing, jobs, commercial services, and then connections to the other town centers. So think about like Hollywood or Interstate, Killingsworth, like these are some of the peer town centers that we have in mind that have similar acreage and they also have light rail. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the, the West Portland Town Center is the only one that doesn't have a plan. So, that's something that you you know there now is a discussion draft for a plan and I'll, I'll give an overview of that so this is an area that serves neighbor neighborhoods with some of the highest performing schools some of the best parks and open space lots of civic amenities and of course a close commute to multiple col multiple colleges and two regional job centers so this is what we'd call a high opportunity area that we want more people to have access to um, we also, through our, our work in, in developing the housing strategy and equitable development strategy, realized that there are areas along the corridor that are some of the most racially and economically diverse areas in, in Southwest Portland, right? And this is where we want the areas to grow and continue to grow more diverse um, as it receives new investment, but we don't want the displacement that we've seen with other um, 
major infrastructure projects, right? We do not want that displacement that can come with becoming a more desirable place, a more livable place. So we've just we've developed a discussion draft um, of this plan, and it really starts with this community vision for a healthy, equitable, and kind of climate resilient future, right? So it's a, it's a bold, holistic plan. And we are now refining specific goals and proposals for new policies and actions, um, everywhere from zoning to infrastructure to the community development. Um, we expect to have a preferred draft for the Planning Commission in early 2021 and then a proposed draft to City Council in the spring. So what is this plan? And the next slide gives just, a, these are the highlight um, descriptors of this plan. It is holistic goals that lead with health equity framed throughout, right? This includes zoning and code changes for, for future development that prioritize public benefits. Um, for equitable development, and I'll explain what that means. It also has a coordinated infrastructure plan with proposed you know, future planning and implementation, right? So it's, some of this is, is what, what's gonna happen and some of it's a, a plan to plan. And then you'll hear all about tonight, there's champions for community development. Um, and I, I'll, I'll let them introduce themselves and their priorities because that's I mean, there's really kind of the heart and soul of this plan. The next slide gives a little sense of how did we get here, right? We, the framing we used early on when we started this, uh, on your left, there's a column on, focus, on people, right? We focused on um, kind of the social environment, right? What do people need to be successful? And this included a kickoff workshop on health equity, a walking tour, um, and kind of a health assessment of, of the area. We then shifted to a focus on place with a series of workshops that created three growth scenarios that um, were crowdsourced through these workshops and then narrowed them to one and got, then got feedback on that one scenario. And that's what you'd see in the discussion draft now. Uh, for the last three months, feels longer, um, bureaus and government agencies have been vetting some of the goals and policies um, that uh, the project team put together to, in the plan. And now it's the community's turn. Right? Did we get it right? Is what the vision that you put forth early on and some of your early priorities, did we interpret that correctly? And is that is that what um, you would like to see moved on to the um, Planning Commission and City Council? So next slide is a little more context about what we mean by focusing on people, right? We focused on the social determinants of health, right? Everyone, needs good health, right? So we looked at physical activity, we talked about social cohesion in the community, housing affordability, economic opportunity, and you know, civic participation. And we used a racial equity lens, right? Looking at how are those most impacted by today's inequities? Um, how are they making the decisions about what's in this plan and how are they benefiting from these investments, right? So how are black, indigenous, and people of color centered in this work um, and are their priorities kind of what's what's leading in the plan and we heard a lot of great things and it led to this um, the next slide is a a vision for you know not just strong communities but strong people right and this this vision statement of a thriving and interconnected community that includes diverse households are that are resilient in the face of displacement pressures and are supported by strong social and cultural institutions as well as human services that benefit all residents so this, this idea that when you, when you focus on those most impacted by these inequities, those solutions um, don't just benefit those, those residents, it benefits all, you know, we all have a shared, a shared destiny, right? A shared interest in health for all, right? But start where the greatest need is. And we wanted to break that out further. So some goals around community and cultural space. Um, and there's some really beautiful vision for a multicultural center that came out of that, that goal. Um, you know, strong small businesses and good jobs, uh, connections to nature, preventing displacement, both residential and cultural and economic, um, and then inclusive engagement in, in all kind of civic institutions. And some of the big ideas, here's a graphic on the next slide of um, part of the town center um, that are, that illustrates some big ideas. So the a multicultural hub located in and around the Barber Transit Center was one idea. Um, retaining and existing the apartment buildings that are there today that um, are dense, are 
uh, serve low-income households and really provide kind of a, a residential and cultural anchor for a lot of the East African and Arab Muslim communities that um, have created a well-established um, community around the two mosques in the area. We want to provide community-based organizations led by and working uh, with communities of color an opportunity to incorporate their priorities in new development. So an opportunity to really engage with developers as they um, enter in this area and, and seek to invest the, and redevelop properties, an opportunity to have a uh, dialogue about what's in this plan and how developments reflect that. Uh, one idea around a, a community garden uh, on the Jackson Middle School campus. And also there is a, there actually is a, a, a programmed park deficiency in the Southern portion of the town center. So while there is a lot of open space and uh, natural areas, there isn't programmed um, park space in that area. So uh, some, some proposals to explore what that would look like to, to fill that deficiency. So the next slide is what, a little more context about what we mean by place. Um, this is a focus on the physical determinants of health, right? So we talk, we look at open space, recreation opportunities, kind of active transportation options, uh, uh, just your, a healthy environment. You know, what are the good conditions that, and that the infrastructure that's needed to support, to support, support those conditions. And this resulted in um, a vision for places with equitable access, right? We don't just want a great place. We want a place that you also can have, uh, has equitable access for all people, right? Um, so this is a natural and built environment that enhances environmental and community health through public amenities. So new commercial services and a supply and variety of housing options for an increasingly diverse population. So this looks like, we broke it out by four goals. Designing with nature, active transportation, um, new housing choices throughout the town center, um, and then a and focused commercial areas, you know, acknowledging some of the, um, uh, that there isn't just one because of the, the, the challenges really of having I-5 and Barber kind of bisect this town center that they're gonna have focused commercial nodes on both sides. Uh, some big ideas, the next slide shows a little graphic of um, what this could look like. Um, so more multifamily housing you know, two, three, four story apartments um, throughout, not just not just along the major corridors, but throughout the town center uh, in areas that are currently zoned for single dwelling. Um, another big idea is employment focused areas along Barber um, that support living wage jobs. So, you know, traditionally what you'd see is just mixed use where you have high cost housing over retail jobs that are traditionally low wage. Um, and we would all, we want to kind of flip that script, right? We're trying to get more affordable housing, but also these employment focus areas um, would, would be, have residential restrictions and it would be kind of allow for different um, sectors of, of the economy to provide office and employment space for, you know, it could be a health center or um, the healthcare industry or call centers or, you know, jobs that are, um, can pay more of a living wage. Another big idea is a green lung uh, along I-5. Uh, so vegetation and trees to mitigate pollution and noise. Um, I mean, the big health play here is more physical activity, but we acknowledge that you know, pollution and noise is, is something that has to be mitigated. And so the idea of a green lung. Alongside that, a green ring, uh, which is a multimodal kind of circulation network around the town center that provides, um, you know, pedestrian and bike access uh, to open spaces and services throughout the town center. Um, another big idea is a new, I mentioned um, commercial areas, both north and south of the, of the town center. So um, on the north side, you have Barber World Foods, but you don't really have a kind of there there for a commercial main street. So looking at Collins Avenue as a new commercial main street. So those are the big ideas coming out of this plan. Um, the next slide shows a little bit of the growth, it shows the growth concept. I'm not gonna um, go too into this. I really encourage everyone to go to the web page, website, look at the open house, read through kind of how these ideas and these goals and this growth concept, you know, how they're described and you know, kind of their implications. Um, 
because I, I would love, to, I just want to make more time for the panel. I think that's, that's kind of the main event here. Um, the next slide is the transportation concept that connects all these new land uses. Um, and I think, I think let's, let's just skip ahead to two slides from now. There's a kind of a visual of what we, what we think um, some of the early, you know, 10 to 15 years, if light rail happens, the kind of early re redevelopment opportunities. Um, this is this is a, a kind of a visual of the future, what it could look like, you know, if new infrastructure, also if the market changes, this is not the strongest real estate market. So um, things have to change in the next 10 or 15 years for this to come true. Lots of things have to align, um, including light rail investment. Uh, but this is some of the early investment we would, you know, we could, is reasonable to predict. Uh, so here's a, here's a, a physical visual. Um, the, it, you can't imagine the social future. Um, and I think that's where some of the, you know, again, I mentioned that kind of the heart and soul of this plan is really in the kind of social cohesion and kind of community power building um, that the South Coast Equity Coalition is doing. So uh, the next slide is just an overview of who are the community champions that are, I'm sorry, two slides from now. Um, that are taking this work and bringing it to life, right? I mentioned the Southwest Equity Coalition. And then within that, there's a, a West Portland Town Center Community Development Work Group. Um, so I'll stop here. I'm sure there's lots of questions um, and pass it over to Chris and Muhammad and Mohammed and John and others to kind of elaborate on how the community is really owning the, some of the top priorities of this plan and, and what those priorities are. Cause I, I barely touched on some of the stuff from a multicultural hub or um, preserving some of those apartments, but, but there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of work and passion around those priorities. So I, I'll, I'll leave space for that. Thanks for having us. Thanks Ryan. There's, before we move on uh, to New Hameen and Mohammed, there, there were three questions that came up. Uh, the first one is if the Metro measure fails, what impact, if any, will that have on the West Portland Town Center planning project? Uh, I, well, that's, I tried to answer that in, earlier on. Um, the town center is, again, the only town center in the city that doesn't have a plan. Um, and this plan is predicated on uh, the assumption that there will be high capacity transit um, sometime. It doesn't, ha it doesn't have to happen first in order for the town center plan to be adopted and, and vetted and all that. So um, we would continue you know, with the community process of, of town center planning, unless told otherwise. Um, TriMet has a lot more thinking to do if the, if the measure doesn't pass because funding is, um, there, there really is a sequential piece there that they gotta get, they gotta get the local funding for. Okay, thanks. Uh, Jaden asks, most Southwest Portland streets in the area lack sidewalks and bike lanes since this will add to the traffic in the area. Are there plans to add sidewalks or other measures for pedestrian safety? Yeah, the transportation concept um, and the implementation plan for it, it really spells that out. Um, there are, you know, the big, that's where light rail is really important though, because that a lot of the improvements uh, in the core come with the light rail project. There are some improvements along Southwest Capitol Highway in, play, in motion. Um, and then you get into uh, what does what is required when new development happens for the development to carry the infrastructure costs. And then that's one side of the coin. The other side is um, how, do you, how do the priorities for new sidewalks and, and, and bike infrastructure, which you know, we have in the plan, but how do those compete for capital dollars uh, compared to East Portland or North Portland, and right, and so you have to kind of get into the the master plan for transportation and compete. I saw a question about the health center and training yeah. clinic. Yeah, is, is the just, training clinic a health center? I I didn't um, understand, didn't know the definition of of training or health center. Um, I I think that's a I'd love to understand that question better before I answer. Uh, and a question that just came in, Ryan, uh, you mentioned getting it right this time. What went wrong with the other town centers and what does the current plan do to mitigate those previous problems? 
Well, there's um, a, lots of lessons learned. I hope uh, the panel, uh, everyone can elaborate on, on their view of history. Um, there was uh, design less flaws in, in previous light rails where, you know, too much um, orientation toward the highway, you know, uh, to really reduce the ability for redevelopment. And um, so that's one, one lesson learned. Uh, on, the, on the yellow line, uh, the displacement that occurred in North Portland and the kind of lack of follow through on the anti-displacement and affordable housing strategies, because there were targets and, go and goals set for that. Um, but some of the implementation and the funding to build the affordable housing didn't show up. Um, and so that's why we started, to, we sequenced our process of planning and we hope implementation by focusing on people first and what the people need first before the kind of um, placemaking and kind of built environment um, priorities. And so affordable housing, workforce development, small business support, like all those things that help people and cultural and social institutions, all those things that help people root in place and have self-determination and um, about to stay uh, and choose to stay, um, that, that that should be the first priority. And that's a, that's a prerequisite to making big infrastructure investments. Um, ultimately, that comes down to accountability with city councils and TriMet and Metro. And I think, you know, that's really where the magic of um, having this broad based coalition that can be a steward of this work um, to, for the long term, which also takes investments in capacity building and resourcing of uh, BIPOC community leaders to, to continue to be in, uh, in leadership positions. Thanks, Ryan. There is a clarification on the health center question. Do you see that? Yeah, I don't think that has an answer yet. I, I you know, I, I would look to Mohammed and, you know, his vision for the multicultural hub, you know, like what are the specific needs? I know, um, yeah, a health center, you know, is, is there a deficiency in this area for a health center? Um, and I, I think that is a, is a good open question. I'd love to continue to answer it with you. Great. Well, thanks so much. So that sounds like a good transition then to New Hamid and Mohammed. Yeah. Thank you, Andrew, for clarifying. I uh, should follow up, especially with the Achieve Coalition. That'd be great to have that conversation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ryan, for that thorough presentation um, to give us a good understanding of the uh, planned infrastructure uh, coming our way. Um, Chris, did you want um, Mohammed to go first or do you want me to go next? I think uh, you guys can sort of choose between yourselves. I think uh, it'd be, I don't think I have an order in mind. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you can, it, yeah, you can go fast, me. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I know, I know, I know you're going to kill it. So <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Thanks for that vote of confidence. I appreciate it. Um, okay, so I have a quick presentation for you all. Um, I know that we have uh, panelists that are ready to go, so I will make this quick. Um, here we go. So the, um, as I said earlier, my name is Nuhamin. Uh, my pronouns are she, they, and I'm with Unite Oregon. Uh, and I am uh, the Southwest Corridor Equity Coalition Manager. And today, I just wanna to talk to you a little bit about the Southwest Corridor. Um, really, um, thank you so much, Ryan. I think that you um, did a fantastic job of explaining what the Southwest Corridor is. I'll just show you um, a map just to give us an understanding of where things are uh, based on these landscapes. Um, and also um, just to ground us in, in the place that we're um, discussing. So this area extends from downtown Portland all the way to Tualatin. So it encompasses so many neighborhoods um, and um, the city of Portland City of Tigard and Tualatin. When we look at this corridor um, 
and think about what's happening there. This coalition is centered around this proposed investment of a 12 mile uh, light rail max extension and uh, the Southwest Corridor Equitable Development Strategy that was created after the affordable housing strategy um, really outlines the need to center the needs of French frontline communities and to anchor the work in uh, racial equity as we move into the, the planning phases. Uh, the strategy envisions a livable, affordable, economically thriving community uh, with reliable and safe transportation options for every resident and commuter. Uh, past transportation related development projects have resulted in voluntary uh, business and residential displacement uh, of BIPOC communities, um, making a lasting impact on Portland's Black community in Northern Northeast Portland. And that's one example. And someone um, asked that question. And I think that's really important to focus on that, uh, that we acknowledge previous harms done to our, to our BIPOC communities, immigrant refugee communities, and other communities that have historically been marginalized and excluded from economic development. So why an equity coalition? What I just said part, partly answers the question, but also um, it's important for us to um, talk about um, how like, communities currently living and working and playing in the areas where development comes they should be also the ones uh, reaping the benefits. And, and I, I love the, um, the term rooted in place and, and prospering in place. I think that's what we really want for our communities. Um, we also want those communities to directly influence the decisions that primarily affect them. Um, historically marginalized communities suffer the consequences from policies and investments planned and implemented without them in mind. We know previous community engagement around public investments haven't always been grassroots and decision has not always um, um, had the hands of people, affected communities shaping it. We want to prevent that from happening this time and government like Metro is relinquishing control to frontline communities to lead the conversation so that we can determine what investment is needed for our communities the coalition will ensure this work um, that, um, that it's led by affected communities and it will also facilitate res resource sharing between public and private partnerships for efficient uh, resource allocation to prevent doubling of efforts between organizations and bureaus and to ensure transparency and accountability of government by the communities they serve. So this um, Southwest Corridor Equity Coalition, we call it SWEC for short. It's kind of like a play on SWEDS, which is the Southwest uh, Corridor Equity Development, Equitable Development Strategy. Um, we are a coordinated effort between community organizations, residents, businesses, philanthropic partners, and state and local government bodies. Um, we come together to advocate for and to resource equitable development practices in, in the corridor. We also work together to implement the Southwest Corridor Equitable Development Strategy. We are committed to disrupting inequitable outcomes and in in public investments. And we do this by ensuring racial equity commitments are resourced, decision-making bodies are held accountable by coalition members and their partners, and all decisions are community-driven. Equity statement that anchors um, the coalition is that we affirm that racial equity an understanding and acknowledgement of historical and ongoing racial inequities and a commitment to actions challenging those inequities is a core tenant of our practice. We do this through our equity commitments that are outlined which prioritize racial equity, implement community-centered decision-making processes ensure the affordable housing, that affordable housing needs are met to create a clear path for the community to participate in decision-making, to strive to prevent any involuntary residential or business displacement, to uphold transparency and to invest in leadership development of frontline communities. Our coalition uh, can be best described through this diagram 
Uh, we have a larger coalition of general membership. However, at the center, we have frontline communities or affected communities um, serving those communities and also led by those communities are the executive committee members. And the executive committee um, and the overall general membership is supported by several or a few work groups and committees. There is an anti-displacement work group that focuses on uh, residential and business displacement. The West Portland Town Center Community Development Work Group, which focuses on the West Portland Town Center uh, specifically, and the Technical Advisory Committee that serves as support for the Executive Committee and the larger coalition. Our strategy is really very simple. Um, we identify frontline communities in the Southwest Corridor um, and we center the work on those communities through resourcing community-based and direct service organizations that are organized with, uh, that are organizing within affected communities. We organize around key issues through work groups and committees and create a centralized system of information sharing and hold space where all stakeholders convene regularly to discuss. Um, we, get together once a month, uh, the whole coalition, but really the members in different groups meet more than once a month. And there is constant resource sharing, um, holding space for the needs of the community and also an opportunity for us to organize and um, discuss key issues with our communities in the Southwest Corridor. Our general membership right now has about 20 members and as I said earlier, there are some of our government agencies and some are funders and some are community-based organizations and businesses. The executive committee is made up of APANO, Community Alliance of Tenants, Hockey Community Organization, and Unite Oregon. Uh, this committee um, is the decision-making body. Um, it will, it's charged with um, making decisions on behalf of the coalition uh, with their um, consent. And we um, also allow for coalition members that aren't allowed to take position on certain decisions to opt out as well, because it's a public private partnership. Um, the executive committee is charged with uh, taking positions on newly proposed public policy changes to support uh, proposed public policy and private development within the Southwest Corridor, uh, rolling in, in and also will, um, is charged with allowing or admitting new coalition members and to create relationship between executive committee and general membership, offering stipends for community participants, providing policy recommendations and reports to governing bodies, ensuring appropriate and sufficient representation of diverse members within the coalition. These are a few of, of the um, responsibilities the executive committee takes on. Our decision-making process, um, like I said, um, for the executive committee is what we call um, inclusive decision-making proce process that focuses on racial justice, uh, promotes accessibility and fairness in procedure, providing access and adequate time to all committee members to review all relevant documents, to accommodate members' accessibility needs when necessary. Um, and also a decision can be made even when there's disagreements upon member, uh, among members. Uh, dissenting members are not under obligation to officially sign off on positions, but will make every effort not to lobby against the coalition's positions. Our committees and work groups, as you saw in the diagram, are listed down here as well. We're currently uh, accepting recommendations for the Technical Advisory Committee, and this committee will, will be made up of uh, experts in areas of land use and transportation, community development, um, housing, business support, uh, and anything that's relevant to the work we're doing. 
So I want to take this opportunity to really say for those that are listening and are interested in finding out more about the coalition or would like to get involved, if you are a business or a resident living in the Southwest Corridor or in a, uh, representing an organization or an agency and wants to uh, have a role, we will be very happy to talk to you um, and also get you involved. Um, so go ahead and email me. My email is up on, on this slide. And we truly believe that um, together we will advance uh, the Southwest Corridor's equity co uh, coalition's uh, equity commitments and work together toward an equitable future for all. Thank you so much for having me present today to you. I really uh, appreciate you tuning in at 7.16 on an evening. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you, Nuhameen. Mohammed, do you have anything to add? Yeah, uh, I'll be to introduce everybody. So uh, yeah, my name is Mohammed Salim uh, Bahamadi, uh, founder director uh, at Haki Community Organization. Um, I'm very glad to uh, be involved into this major uh, decision uh, panelist and also uh, uh, making decision with the West Portland Town Center as uh, we are minorities and uh, uh, people of color and uh, you know um, uh, we we felt before that we were left behind but now uh, we feel like we are uh, being uh, included into all these and um, I'm here to uh, make sure and also to uh, uh, represent those minorities who don't know much, who don't speak English and uh, to uh, do the uh, equitable, uh, 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 to, to bring in the, the ideas and to know what's happening around them. And I'm very glad uh, to be uh, doing this. Uh, I know Ryan and uh, Nuhaymin already killed it and uh, uh, they have provided all the information. Uh, but it, for me, it's just to touch bases that uh, Haki community did with the uh, uh, city of Poland and uh, uh, with, the, with the SWAC, like doing the, uh, 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 the walk tour, we found that those, those sidewalks were too narrow and we need them to be like a little bit broader. And uh, like there are other places also already being uh, uh, implemented, like to have those uh, uh, plants, uh, like road plants, and then people. So at least people feel secure uh, that the cars are like a little bit far. So those are the things that we came up uh, from from the sidewalk that uh, we did uh, uh, that time. Um, so. Uh, uh, uh especially here in southwest uh, uh we have like multicultural communities around here and uh like uh the uh, east african communities um uh, and uh uh, uh and ryan already mentioned uh because of this uh pcc sylvania here and there's a mosque and a Mal uh, Markham elementary school is like a multicultural school also very uh, welcoming to uh uh, many uh, many cultures, so you see a big uh, BIPOC communities here uh, in South, especially where that West Portland Town Center is going to be built. Uh, so I don't have much to say. Thank you, uh, Nehemin and Ryan, for uh, uh, saying everything I wanted to say. I uh, really appreciate that. And uh, yeah, thank you, guys. Thanks, Mohammed. Before we turn it over to Commissioner Myron, there is a question uh, pertaining to the SWAC presentation. And the question is, as a longtime tenant, I understand the importance of elevating the voice of renters who tend to be the most vulnerable to loss of representation in these discussions. As a new homeowner, I find myself in a somewhat different role. What is the role of homeowners in the development of Southwest Corridor and how is their voice being incorporated into this important work? And then the the person asking the question um, offered a little bit more context that, that I am BIPOC and not particularly financially well off and know that many of my neighbors feel the same way. Yeah, thank you so much for uplifting that because um, those 
facing displacement aren't only renters. Um, I find myself in the same boat. Um, I rented for a long time in the in the metro area, in the Portland metro area, and um, I'm a new homeowner myself, living in this in this neighborhood. And so is um, Mohammed, who can talk to you a little bit about that as well. And um, we know that financial security and stability uh, is linked to displacement and being a homeowner doesn't exempt you from that. Uh, we know that um, property taxes increasing also threaten um, a lot of folks who are on fixed income, either retirement uh, or disability that are um, wanting to age in place and enjoy, um, enjoy their neighborhoods. So this work is for everyone. It's, um, it's important to folks from coming from several different walks of life. And I just truly really want to say thank you for uplifting that in this conversation. Yeah, thank just, you, just to touch a little bit about, uh, about, about the home ownership. So um, Haki community has that program also, uh, home ownership. When I came in 2012, paying my first rent, 850 in, back in Africa, 850, you, you can leave, uh, you can rent like a beach house back there. So uh, of course, depending on, uh, uh, on the income. So uh, we have home, and, home ownership um, uh, programs here, Haki community. And um, with me like uh, doing that and uh, uh, succeeding and I will be in my, in my house, in my own home, like, uh, I don't know, tomorrow or Friday, because tomorrow is a, is a closing date of my uh, home buying. <laughs> yeah, uh, so maybe I will get my keys tomorrow or before the end of this week. So I want everybody to, 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 uh, to get into this program, you know, uh, whenever I talk to people be your own landlord you know with with us from africa with less uh, little english and with our accent we get lots of discrimination mistreatments from landlords managers so i tell people be your own landlord and they say in america where can we get that uh, 60000 50000 down payment but for me since i came to 12 i've been like going to all these home buying classes and searching and all these uh, program um, uh, Habitat for Humanity program, and now I am like a freelance uh, home buyer. Um, so uh, there are programs, you know, uh, that can save you for your down payment. Uh, for me, I enrolled myself into three programs, and I ended up having like sixty thousand for my down payment. And uh, all those are just from programs like IDA program, um, uh, Home Forward Goals program, and. Uh, with a uh, uh, four uh, four or three B uh, saving for your retirement, you can also use that as emergency money to use for your down payment. So all this program, now I want people to know when uh, when I collected all these, I ended up having sixty thousand for my down payment and all my closing expenses. So we have that program. We we want people to own houses, uh, and they say it's expensive to maintain house. But paying rent, that money goes away. But paying mortgage, that's your money. You're investing, even if it's a little bit high, but that's your own money after 10, 20 years. Say, I don't want this headache like anymore. Sell that house, you get your equity and you can open a business if you don't wanna be a homeowner anymore. So uh, yeah, uh, uh, people, let's uh, try to uh, own houses so we can get rid of these uh, discrimination and mistreatment from landlords and managers. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, Commissioner Myron. Let's see. Thank you. Um, this has been such an incredible uh, panel and it, it was like, oh, I'm speaking. I just am so engaged by the presentation. Um, so uh, I want to, uh, first of all, thank Neighborhoods, uh, Neighborhood House again for hosting this forum and bringing us all together this evening. Uh, talk a little bit more about what the county does and how it aligns with some of the considerations in this work and this vision. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people don't know what the county does. We often fly under the radar. Uh, Multnomah County is home to more than 800,000 residents, uh, it covers 465 square miles, it has six cities. And we provide the vital services to meet the needs of our community for uh, people who are elders, uh, people with disability, animal services, 
uh, bridges for some reason, um, community justice, courts, our election system, uh, very prominently health and dental clinics, our corrections and jails, libraries, marriage license, passports, housing, homelessness services and shelters, and much more. Uh, and we uh, serve those who are unable to earn uh, sufficient income to meet their basic needs. Uh, and much of the work that we do while we serve the whole community, much of it is really focused on those who are marginalized, vulnerable, or whose needs aren't met elsewhere. Uh, people in mental health crises, uh, people who need uh, emergency shelter, older adults facing isolation, uh, and so much more. And across and throughout that work, Multnomah County really strives to center equity. Uh, we do this in a variety of ways, um, and it is an ongoing uh, and active process for all of us to co constantly improve upon this work. Uh, we've developed a workforce equity strategic plan, and uh, we do the work through listening, through learning, through empowering, and through directly investing in communities who are disproportionately affected by inequities, including health inequities and other preventable disparities. So um, I was so impressed by the thoughtful planning and work that's gone into the West uh, Portland Town Center project so far to address um, and center health equity. And the early health equity assessment and direct inclusive engagement in particular uh, is what um, has inspired me. It's engagement of the people actually impacted by this project. And that's so fundamental to delivering on a vision to ensure that everyone experiences the economic and health benefits of future improvements. Um, this is particularly, particularly true of um, you know, uh, Black, Indigenous, uh, immigrants, uh, other people of color, uh, and so uh, many of the people that live, work, and play in this um, vibrant area. So in terms of health equity, I, I, the county oversees public health. You, no one really saw us until COVID. We sort of like blossomed and uh, suddenly more people are familiar with, pub, with the county than they had been before. But I sort of think of public health as basically everything. Um, we have in particular recognized that um, there are what we call social determinants of health. And that is so much more than what we traditionally think of as you know, healthcare in a hospital or clinic system. These are things like access to transportation, um, clean air, access to natural spaces, uh, access to food, um, housing services, uh, sh things to get people uh, out of homelessness. Uh, and that is what public health actually is about. It is improving people's lives uh, so that we can prevent the disparities that we see, those outcomes we see that are too often the result of investment um, and improvements that end up uh, causing gentrification, displacement, and uh, further deepening of disparities. We've recognized that institutional and structural racism is a public health crisis. And um, the impacts of this on, uh, on health, on actual, we do consider health, like heart attacks, um, infant mortality and maternal mortality, all of this uh, is directly impacted uh, negatively by uh, structural racism. So I, I am just so excited to see this project um, really center that and recognize it up front and recognize it is about individuals uh, and community and that social aspect and building that larger built environment once we've focused on the people. Um, and 
I just want to throw one one other element out there uh, and elevate the potential for this being an intentional age-friendly community as well. Uh, age-friendly is sort of an international approach, but uh, is being really um, elevated by AARP at the state and local levels uh, to support to support elders um, to develop policies and services and structures related to the physical and social environment to support and enable older people to age actively. So to live in security, enjoy good health, continue to participate fully in society. And this dovetails perfectly with um, the focus that we are taking such as the, or, or that this project is taking including um, the multicultural hub and the focus on uh, being able to walk and experience the what we end up with as our built environment. Anyway, um, this, this is so exciting. And as a neighbor, as a physician who focuses on health a lot and as a county commissioner uh, who looks at that broader policy, I am grateful for the work that has been done and really look forward to seeing this project develop. Thank you, Commissioner Myron. Uh, John. Um, I don't know what I could say after those uh, wonderful panelists before me, but um, definitely uh, just kind of reiterating a lot of what they said. Um, in people and community-based development, um, you have to look at the wide range of individuals um, within that community. So I, I have to commend uh, Joan and BPS and Hockey and uh, the SWEX committee on going that extra mile. This is a lot of extra work in comparison to a lot of other initiatives in the past. It would be easy to kind of gloss over or do a tokenism in regards to uh, kind of addressing equity. So definitely very impressed with all the work that has been done. Um, something that Sweeney itself is in the midst of kind of uh, trying to replicate as well. You guys are great leaders. Um, but definitely in regards to um, engaging individuals that don't really have that institutional knowledge of how to operate within the system or how to be somewhere um, when it matters to vote or do anything such as that. So um, in, in kind of the, the frame of equity, I think it is our responsibility as community members, planners, um, people who contribute to our community to make sure that the individuals that um, might not recognize, you know, a, a green a light over here, meaning, you know, now it's time to vote, um, has access to our system, has access to um, participating in the, the dialogue that shapes our communities. Um, I think that equity is a very much of a trigger word at the moment. However, the way I look at it is, is that the richness of a society is based on the uniqueness of the people living within it. Um, I, I personally would not be in favor of living in a monoculture where everything was the same, everybody dressed the same. I think our individuality is kind of what defines us and embracing other community societies and um, just things outside of our comfort zones and our experiences is only gonna enrich us. So again, definitely have to give a lot of props to BPS, um, Newman from United Oregon taking the lead on the SWEX committee. Um, and Sweeney is just very excited to kind of follow your role as well as um, do the work in equity um, internally first as, and then maybe that will reflect in uh, our actions in the future, such as what you guys are doing. Oh, you as well, Nate. Oh, Chris, sorry, neighborhood house. Thank you. Thanks so much, John. Uh, before we turn to our panel, open panel questions, uh, I wanna uh, share something that came in on the, on the question and answer. And this was from Will Fuller. He said, please let renters know, renters and BIPOC residents know that they are members of their neighborhood association. As Multnomah Neighborhood Association Equity Chair, I extend a warm welcome for you to be involved. Call me at 503-764-5501 or go to swinney.org forward slash Multnomah for how to get involved. And so I know I said that phone number quickly, but it should be accessible in the Q&A if you want to follow up there. So thanks so much. Uh, and turning to our panel, and, and these questions are really open to all of our panelists, how do we assure racial equity, not only in our process, which we've talked a little bit about tonight, uh, particularly with, with SWEC and its structure and its role, 
but uh, also how do we assure racial equity in our results? Chris, could you repeat that question? Of course. How do we assure racial equity in our process and how do we assure it in our results? I can I can take that question. If the, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Mohammed. No, I, I want to start from just the roots, from uh, just down there, and then uh, Nuhaimin will finish. So just to start by uh, seeing that equity uh, is uh, 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 is uh, looking into uh, like uh, us, uh, Haki, where we uh, we try to bring all uh, all different tribes, cultures, and uh, 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 multicultural uh, communities during these uh, these meetings, and we try to uh, let them know what's happening and to get their input, you know. And also, I share forward whenever we have meetings with uh, West Portland Town Center. So that's from the grassroots. Uh, we try to uh, involve each and every uh, communities around here. Like uh, Haki has partnered with the mosque. Um, uh, we go to PCC Sylvania and uh, also we try to engage with uh, with the students there. And uh, I'm also a member of uh, PTA at uh, Markham. Uh, you see, so this kind of thing. So uh, we are trying to uh, reach to the roots of uh, all these uh, 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 different tribes and cultures uh, here. In Southwest, so I I just started from the roots there up. So you know, I mean, uh, you can you can finish there. Yeah, I like this like theme of root coming up. It keeps coming up, so I, I will go with that. I think that um, understanding the roots of inequity in our in our society really will help us understand um, when we talk about housing, where uh, so very few uh, BIPOC homeowners. Um, and if we're talking about our workplaces or our schools and really thinking about uh, and questioning why and not really taking things at, at face value. Uh, and I think when you get to the root of the matter, um, racism, uh, institutionalized racism and white supremacy has been uh, the really root of all of these inequities that we experience today. We may be seeing just like the rotten fruit at the, at the top, but it's because it's because it's, it goes way deeper than that. Uh, so I think once we understand that and we are committed to uh, rooting it out um, and uh, also the small um, steps we take, you know, for example, if your PTA does not have any representation of other community members, and if you're saying like, oh, I'm taking up space, I wanna make sure I, I will relinquish that space for folks whose voices are not represented here. Um, it may look like a very small gesture, right? But it really, uh, it gets to the root of the matter of a lack of representation, a lack of agency uh, for those communities that are not represented. So I would say start there um, and then change the things you have power to change in your life, uh, the small things right there, and uh, they will lead to greater change. Thank you to both of you. I want to extend this question a little bit and, and kind of bring back a question that was asked earlier and that Ryan spoke to a little bit, but I think probably deserves a revisiting. In terms of getting it right, in terms of the result, uh, we know in the past that, that equity has not been front and center and some of the results have, have borne that out. Are there opportunities in this process for community members to show up uh, in more of an advocacy or activist role, and and if so, when are the when are the opportunities to make sure that voices are heard to influence uh, some of the broader decision making? I'll I'll take that one too, if that's okay. I Joan, I've, I'll just say just a little bit about SWEC's role in that. We're uh, we really want community members to take that role. Um, and we're working with our um, partners in different government agencies 
to be transparent about these decision-making spaces and opportunities, and then also open those spaces up in terms of providing childcare, translation and interpretation, the timing of when it takes place, uh, addressing the digital divide. Not everyone has internet and smartphones, believe it or not, that's the case. And so just, and then also for us, giving them that feedback that they need so that when they're building out their budget, they're thinking about um, not creating barriers for folks. Sorry, Joan, go ahead. I don't think I'm technically on the panel, but. <laughs> Uh, you're 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 filled in for Ryan who had to leave. So he apologized that he did need to leave. He really wanted to stay, but Joan, you're up. So I'll just jump in. I mean, I think that yeah. I mean, I think there's. I think no, no, I mean, said it. You know, said it best. But I'll just echo what she said. And it's it's um, um it's continuing to to build um the the you know the the procedural so the agencies that are in charge of the of the processes to to build in um those resources and that understanding of the need for um community capacity building in the broadest sense right everybody but very much in particular um groups uh community members who have not been um able to voice their uh their needs um, their priorities so that's that's something that we try to do with this plan it's, it's not ever perfect right there's there's a lot, <laughs> um, but the idea is that we continue to build our knowledge and our relationships to be able to continue to um, get better at that moving forward. And it's really exciting to be working in parallel, right? We've got our legislative community development work that the city's doing, but we're working parallel to um, this coalition that is, is really, um, going a little bit deeper than we can, reaching out in different ways than we can. So there's, it's a, it's, it's really exciting to be uh, working together. Yeah, uh, so they say charity starts at home. Um, I uh, went to do interpretation classes just to do this community work. Uh, so uh, I'm an uh, interpreter by, uh, by profession also. So um, I wanna make sure that our community understand and uh, uh, get involved in uh, in whatever is uh, is happening. Whenever we are at a meeting, I will be doing interpretation to them, and uh, uh, we have like a child care uh, professionals uh, in our community. Just for that, you know, whenever we have a meeting, uh, uh, people should not say uh, we don't uh, we don't have somebody. To leave our kids at uh, home, so we uh, we cannot come to the meeting. No, we have professional child care. We uh, we uh, we have professional uh, interpreters. So, as I say, charities are at home, so we are all set for that. So whenever we have uh, any uh, uh, informational uh, uh, informational meetings or uh, gathering, uh, I try to bring. Uh, 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 all communities to come and hear and also give uh, their feedback. So we try to do all that um, uh, to our uh, low um, uh, minority people to get involved. Thank you all for that answer. We have uh, an answer uh, from our guests uh, and it's specifically for Neighborhood House. and. But I, but I think that, uh, Mohammed, you might also have a perspective on this question as well. Uh, it says, how are the early childhood programs at Neighborhood House promoting anti-racist learning environments? And uh, that's, a, that's a really good question. And Head Start, our Head Start program uh, has uh, extensive involvement with parents and families in uh, not only the day-to-day -day classroom activities and delivery of the program, but also in the steering of the program. So we have a regularly established parent advisory council that also seeds a member on our neighborhood house board of directors and is there as a represent, representative of the voice of the family uh, in, in our Head Start program. And um, I'm wondering, Mohammed, if you, you might have some perspective on this 
talking about HESA program, yeah. my friend, I think you'll have to give me uh, uh, enough, enough time here, but I will try to shorten it up. So okay. HESA program is not only for kids. I want to start with that. HESA program, it's a broad um, uh, educational and involvement with the parents and uh, uh, families. Uh, my leadership started from there. Because uh, when I came 2012, I had a five-year-old, three-year-old, and a one-year-old. So the five-year-old was ready to go to uh, to uh, Head Start, and the and the and the three-year-old and that and the one-year-old got the the home visitor. So with all that um, involvement with the Head Start, uh, I was picked to be parent uh, 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 parents. Uh, association uh, leader and they called me president and so we went to Salem and I learned all this stuff so my leadership came from Head Start program uh, uh, going to Salem to uh, advocate for all these Head Start program to keep on supporting uh, the Head Start program and uh, it's amazing the way uh, we do these parenting meetings uh, you meet different uh, families and uh, you share food and ideas and it's not only uh, uh, educating the kids and uh, when uh, when we came again 2012 my kids didn't have any English uh, but when they went to school uh, to uh, neighbor house head start in fact within like three months they were correcting my English you know <laughs> and and they didn't have even a single word in English yes or no maybe but uh, nothing else but then they started correcting my English they said dad you don't say like that I said okay uh, so uh, it's not only for kids it's for kids so when it was time for them to go to kindergarten they were ready uh, they had their English they had their ABCD writing you know uh, also coloring, otherwise, if it's not head start, they will start at um, kindergarten and that will be like a lot of work. But the head start is like pushing them, get them ready for kindergarten, grade one, grade two, you know, uh, so when they go into that state, they're ready. Uh, getting them also to know that there are other families outside there, there are also kids that you got to uh, get along with. So it's a lot with the Head Start program. It brings up uh, community leaders. It brings up uh, engagement with families and uh, uh, kids get to know uh, each other and also learn the social um, gathering with other kids, you know, uh, and uh, they learn manners and uh, engagement with other kids. So Head Start is a lot. If you ask me to speak about Head Start, I think you, I'll need more hours. Thanks. Thanks, Mohammed. I, I really appreciate that. Um, our Head Start traditionally uh, is, is a, a very diverse classroom. We have, uh, I think the number is actually higher in the current cohort that just started in the fall, but we traditionally have around 25 uh, or more home languages in, across our classrooms. Um, and we, the, one of the great things about the Head Start model is that through parent engagement, there's also, Mohammed talked a little bit about leadership opportunity and leadership engagement, uh, influence over the direction of the program. Uh, but also there's a, there's a workforce development aspect to Head Start. So we have our Markham Head Start, for example, both of our lead teachers our former Head Start parents who came up through that workforce development piece started as assistant classroom, well, volunteers in the classroom and then assistant classroom teachers. And now, uh, unfortunately, that program is, is being delivered a little bit differently this fall because Markham, as we all know, is, is not accessible due to COVID. But so th that's another aspect that, that we really uh, appreciate about the Head Start model. I, in the interest of time, we're, we're winding down a little bit in time and I encourage people, if you have any other questions, post them. Uh, and we'll try to get to them. But I want to combine a couple of questions because I think it, they probably hit, there's probably a piece in here for all the panelists. So I'll do my best to, to, to meld two of these together. How, the question, multi-part question is, how do we show up for the most vulnerable in our communities? What do we do well? What do we need to work on? Uh, and at the end of the day, how do we create a neighborhood that is safe and nurtures everyone? And how do we get there? So there's a, it's a lot packed in there, but um, I think probably, John, you probably have some ideas on that. Yeah, um, 
Definitely. I think just in general, the West Portland Town Center and its development in itself um, essentially aids integration um, just because a lot of fears or um, a lot of our social and cultural problems or issues that we have now, um, in my opinion, this is a, my, a John DePero opinion, is based off of the unknown. Um, it's just based off of um, a group of people that have traditions, customs, and a way of doing things that might just slightly veer from the way that you've been taught. Um, and all that is, is the unknown and um, the fear of the unknown. So I think by basing a very important uh, development such as the West Portland Town Center as um, there's a very much of a lack of community centric um, development along that corridor, um, it, it would just essentially expose people to things um, that they might have seen from a distance, but now they're willing or able to engage. Um, and I think that in itself will um, build community, will build better integration and just um, more of an acceptance just across the board. Um, I think the way in which um, Sweeney has been really thinking about internally about how do we engage um, these communities that we traditionally as neighborhood association, a uh, coalition office don't effectively uh, in the past engage. Um, and a lot of that is um, essentially just kind of stepping out of um, our processes, um, you know, evaluating our programs, who they're tailored to, um, and why we're doing things in the way that we're doing. Um, while this pandemic is, 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 it's been rough for everybody, let's all admit it. Um, one of the great things that have kind of popped out of this um, pandemic is the fact that these virtual meetings are so easy to develop. And um, this type of um, using technology or just addressing a lot of the barriers to access um, that exist within a lot of uh, vulnerable communities, communities of friendly, BIPOC communities, where, um, you know, if you're going to attend a neighborhood association meeting, um, you have to hire, you know, a babysitter, you have to possibly get translation, you have to drive to that location and drive back, you have to make sure your family is fed. Um, you have employment barriers as well. So by having meetings or having different avenues of meeting people in place or to tailor our programming and the way we do community engagement so people can have access and removing a lot of those barriers um, in very, very simple manners. I mean, Zoom meetings, um, before the pandemic, we might've thought this was a bit daunting to get this many people on a, a video conferencing call, but it, it really is easy. Um, and we just need to really rethink the way in which um, we were proceeding to accomplish our goals and making sure that everybody's um, able to communicate their needs and desires. And could I, I, I just um, would love to quickly, I, I, uh, John um, took what I was going to say, I just wrote in big letters down was engagement um, and recognize you know how do we engage in a meaningful way we do it through our traditional community based organizations but we we have to expand beyond that and at, what is this i think that is both something that is um that we do well in the sense of we have the whole coalition and it's something we can do better uh in terms of what are these new innovative ways to reach out to people and I also just want to throw in the issue, the issue of digital equity um, cannot be um, the, the importance of that issue cannot be overstated. And I think that's something that we can think about in terms of infrastructure, et cetera. We just had a briefing about this today at Multnomah County um, that in terms of those barriers to access, so many people just might they might not be able to afford it, might not be able to recognize, you know, know how to use it, might not be able to just get the equipment and figure that out. Like, so there's so many layers to that. And some places it physically doesn't exist, the infrastructure to do it. So um, this access to reliable high-speed internet is essential to go to school right now, to work to have meetings like this and engage with community. 
And so what are we doing? It is not a luxury, it's a necessity. And how are we ensuring that people who are most marginalized and vulnerable um, and traditionally might not have access can have that kind of uh, connection? So uh, a little bit, uh, 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 how do we engage? Uh, simple, I would say, uh, whenever there is a community engagement, be there. Or try to uh, listen or uh, follow up or ask or do whatever, but um, do something. Uh, with me, uh, since I was like growing up, I just find myself in the middle of problem solving, you know, and then I will ask myself, what am I doing here? You know, but I love uh, helping people and, uh, uh, when when I have somebody and I see that a person gets uh, help or uh, uh, he prosper, I, that's like food to my soul. So be there. Uh, how do you engage? Just be there whichever way you can. Uh, that way you can contribute. Don't say this is not for me. No, this is uh, somebody else's uh, issues. No, try to uh, ask and also give ideas if you can and if you have time, try to be there. Thanks, Mohammed. Uh, Just to follow up on that really yeah, quickly, I think um, love what Mohammed was saying. Um, um, as uh, a Western individuals who grew up primarily, a lot of us in the Western culture were were taught that if you know the answer, you're you're the smartest person in the room, right? Um, a lot of engagement is going to be just listening to to. Um, kind of acknowledging and humbling yourself to know that yes, you might know the answer in a Western context, but these people have, other individuals have different truths um, based upon their experiences and um, their upbringing. So um, listening, just not talking, <laughs> listening, making sure people have uh, the space to convey uh, thoughts, emotions, and not, and not, uh, and accepting those and not uh, trying to correct. I think are our big keys to kind of just developing individual relationships that can go on to be much more. Thank you, John. Uh, if there aren't any other thoughts on that one, I have a closing question for the panelists. And um, but I'll pause for a moment and see if anybody has anything to add. Okay. Uh, how can the community get involved? So if if uh, someone is attending this and, and has gotten this information is maybe new to this to this planning effort. Uh, what's what are some ways to get involved, and what are some things that are started or already in process that could use more community support and engagement? I think I think John uh, uh, last. Last time when we had this West Portland Town Center, you, we were inviting uh, the public also to come, like Mark, um, they can come in here and also give their feedback. Um, I remember doing that. And also now, because there's no like physical meeting, uh, but uh, in the Zoom, also there, there are uh, chances, opportunities for public to, to attend and also to give feedback either uh, uh, at that time, just like what what we are doing right now, we are engaging the community also. So uh, yeah, uh, many of these uh, meetings, uh, the community, uh, uh, the public uh, is welcome. So it's just to follow up and see uh, they can they can get involved uh, in such uh, meetings like today. Yeah, I would like to say also. Um email the coalition, you can email me. I put my email in the chat. Um, we would love to have you attend the meetings, um, serve on a different committee or work group. Um, those are like some of the ways you can get involved, but also um, you could get involved through your local neighborhood association, uh, through any of the community-based organizations that are listed um, that I'll also share with you here in the chat shortly. So I, I thank you, uh, Mohammed and, and Hamin. Um, yeah, I wanted to also share that. Oops. I also wanted to share that um, 
the um, the West Portland Town Center uh, plan just put out the discussion draft, which Ryan shared a little bit about. Um, but we have just with that release of the discussion draft, we have a 45 day comment period. So um, this is an opportunity for folks to um, learn more about the draft. Um, take that conversation out right into the community, have talk to your neighbors, talk to your neighborhood association, all those types of things, um, and bring comments back, really um, share with us what what uh, what you think of the plan and um, the pieces that are in there. Um, the uh, We are going to be, in addition to um, having uh, the comment period open, we have an online open house that really sort of in a very, step-by-step um, -step way tries to tell the story of, of the plan. And um, for those who are initiated and those who aren't initiated, it's a great way to learn about what's in the discussion draft. There's a survey link on there as well. And I've put the, um, I've put the link in the um, in the chat so you can uh, find all find your way there. Um, we also will be having some um, information sessions online the week of. Uh, well, I think we've scheduled them for November 12th and November 18th. We might add another one on the 19th, but we're seeing how that goes. And we'll also be at different neighborhood association meetings, hopefully the week of the 9th. So we'll be posting all the different meetings that we're going to be at so folks can learn more and ask questions and have an opportunity to be involved. Once we're done with the discussion draft, we'll go back into work mode and um, we'll be uh, preparing a proposed draft that will go before the Planning and Sustainability Commission. There'll be opportunity at that juncture for public testimony. So that's a, a big opportunity to be involved. And after that, later in the fall of 2021 at city council. So there are many opportunities to come. Um, thank you for having us this evening. I have also posted uh, our website, Facebook page that uh, whenever we do stuff like this, uh, we let uh, the public know. So you can also follow us uh, on our website and also Facebook to uh, get involved. Well, I, I want to thank all of our panelists uh, for coming and sharing it. And I want to thank all the attendees also for attending and for your questions and your interest and We'll leave the meeting open for a few minutes. If you have other questions, we certainly can follow up. I know, uh, I think I've seen uh, contact information for all the panelists in the chat. So we'll leave that open so you can grab that. But if you have any follow-up questions, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, my contact information is also in the chat. And thank you all for not only for this work, but for sharing the work and sharing the commitment to equity moving forward. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. What a great panel. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, John. All right, I guess I'm gonna go ahead and end the meeting. Are we, is everybody gone? <laughs> Just about, I think. Okay. Um, yeah, I think everybody who meant to hang up has, so. Okay, cool. Okay, yeah. thank you thank all you. so much. Yeah. All right. Have a good night. Have a good night. Yeah, good to see you, Mohammed well. and Chris and good Ellen. Take Bye. care. Take care. Bye, Bye Hannah. Good to see you all, guys. Thank you. Let's keep on doing the good work, guys. Yes. Thank you, Chris, for organizing this. Very, yeah, thank you so much. Stellar. You guys are so great. It's so great to work with you. <laughs> yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye now.